Assalamu alaikum, welcome back to Reborn on Ahlul Bayt TV with our guest today, Sister Amina Khan. And uh, just before the break, Sister Amina, you had got up to the point where the, those around you within the church realized that you were thinking about becoming a nun. Mm -hmm. How old were you at this point? Uh, I was, I just turned 16. Right. Yeah. So literally a year or so into, into joining, after joining the church. Mm, yeah. Okay. So, so you mentioned how the priest helped you get some numbers mm. and presumably you applied at, at that no. stage or later on? Um, the thing was you, you, uh, he gave me two addresses to get in contact with. One was an active order that specialised in nursing the elderly and the sick and also running a guest house, hospitality. And the other address was of a contemplative order. One that meant that they didn't have, they wouldn't go outside for, say for instance, to do teaching or social work or nursing. And their life was a life of prayer only. Oh, prayer only, okay. Mm. So the one I got in contact with first was the uh, active order because I thought, okay, you get the best of both worlds. Uh, so the first thing I did was write a letter asking if I could come on, uh, to come on a retreat. And uh, so I did do that later on in the summer. But it was to do, it was um, a one week retreat and then one week to work in the guest house. So I'd get a taste. Hmm. Um, I didn't actually, right to the contemplative order because uh, I don't know I thought okay that one will be enough and I'm not sure about contemplative order sure. but it was a priest who had said I went to that contemplative order the other day and they said you haven't written to them I was like, okay fine I'll write to them so and I asked if it would be possible to stay with them for three days in their guest house so and that was arranged Okay. And that would be over the summer as well. Okay, so presumably that summer you did, bo you w you did both? Yeah. Okay, and what was the conclusion you came to after experiencing both? Okay, the, the active order. I came to the conclusion that if you can juggle both lives of uh, uh, religious service to God and doing nursing, that's good, but I thought I couldn't do that because it would be like splitting myself into two. Really? Yeah. And uh, the contemplative order, now that was different. And I thought it was more inviting and more warm, even though at that point I'd meet the sisters behind what was called a grill in the parlour, which was like um, meeting them behind a gate. Why was um, that? Well, it's to do with the rule of enclosure and how uh -huh. it's interpreted. Okay. So we'd be in a, um, a room, but it would be partitioned by a small wall and these gates, and part of the gate would open. And on my side, it would be carpeted and comfy chairs, warm, nice curtains. And then on their side, it was bare wooden boards, white wall, crucifix, a hard chair, and that was that. But actually that appealed more to me. Mm. And also at that, uh, the time I spent with them, I was also allowed in the garden. Um, so, and the gardens were huge. Mm. Um, they were nice, uh, and so that's how I got to see sort of a bit more. And I met different sisters each day while I was there. The three days you were there. So, mm. <coughs> you then decided that you were going to be to join the contemplative order? Uh, no, I thought my calling was sort of heading towards being contemplative, to be enclosed. Um, but it wasn't for another few years before I could um, actually join them. Because? Because of my age. Oh. I was 16, you have to be over 18. Right. Um, and also I looked into different contemplative orders during that time uh, and also another monastic house which was of the same order as mm. the same ones I'd stayed with. 
So you joined you joined one of the orders at the age of 18. No, <laughs> I was at a college doing my A levels. Okay. And um, I w and then I'd finished college and I went to uh, on like a pilgrimage to Assisi in Rome. And and I'd sort of been put, not put off the idea of being a religious, being a nun, but I didn't think it was right for me. As when I sort of um, had um, began the pilgrimage, but when I came back, I thought, and I had the choice of going back to college, so I went back to college on the Monday morning, and halfway through the morning, I just sort of decided, right, I'm going to ask to enter. So I walked out of college, wrote a letter, uh, and I said, uh, there are a few things I said in it, and I said the, the last thing, or, um, and another thing is I'd like to ask uh, formally for permission to enter the religious order. So I sent the letter, and I was going in a few weeks because they were having a profession of one of the sisters, which meant she'd finished all her training and novitiate, and she was being professed as a nun properly, so she'd swap her white veil for a black veil mm. and she was in there then for life. Really? Uh, yeah, so, so that, that was when we decided, okay, come and see us properly then. During that, that time frame, from when I was 16 to when I was um, 19, um, I'd sort of had a few, I'd been in for a month at a time with the sisters and um, sort of been on open days. Uh, and be with them for for like some weeks during my half term and that. Um, so I got to know them and they got to know me quite well. Okay. So um, how long were you in this particular order for once you, you decided to join at the age of about 19? Yeah, I was in the order itself for about uh, four years. Really? Yeah. And is, uh, uh, how long does it take for you to swap, or for one to swap a white veil for a black veil? In other words, did you manage to get through the whole process of, uh, if you like, the graduation process, or was this something that would have taken a lot longer than four years? Um, it would have taken uh, a minimum of four and a half years. So really? I was near the time. So you were quite close to the end yeah. of your, of your tenure. Yeah. And then you decided that, did you decide to leave yourself? Yes, I did. Why? Um, well, during the, my monastic life, my life as a nun, it wasn't just sort of a life of prayer. You know, you get up in the morning, you pray all day, all afternoon, all evening, go to bed, and that's it. We had other jobs to do. And uh, one of the jobs I was printing, uh, I had novitiate for my training, but... The other thing that I was encouraged... Uh, novitia, sorry, if you could yeah. just... Novitia was like uh, training. So one of the sisters would be your novice mistress. And um, she would sort of teach you the rules of the order um, and about the, the order saints. Our, our order saints were Carmelites, so St. Teresa of Avila and things like that. But... That, that was the membership training, but I was also encouraged to do studying. Okay. So things like uh, early scripture, Jewish and Christian scriptures. Okay. Uh, a lot of Bible study, um, early church history. And it was doing this studying and also uh, learning Arabic from one of the other sisters. Learning Arabic. Yeah, she'd been to. Uh, she'd had three years in Cairo, Carmel. Uh, so this is produ uh, presumably an or a Catholic order in yeah, Egypt. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It was. Uh, it's now in Al Fayyum. They they moved, but um, at the time they were in Cairo, a Catholic order in Cairo, and uh, they were quite an international community, and one of the sisters at the monastery that I was in, she had gone to Cairo to help out 
and she'd learned Arabic from one of the Lebanese sisters and from the Egyptian gardeners, you know. So um, then I found out about this, and I've always been into language learning, and so I was like, teach me some, teach me some, and she's like, okay, fine. So she taught me some, and then we went together to sort of like learn more about Arabic. And you went together, what, well, we outside sort of, of... No, no, we sort of... That's a bit wrong. We sort of encouraged each other to sort of continue learning Arabic. So it meant sort of uh, getting books from the library, or there was one where we got a New Testament, a children's New Testament in Arabic. Okay. So we would sort of painstakingly try and learn the Arabic and read the Arabic. Mm. Yeah. Was there was a there was was there a copy of the Quran in English or Arabic in, uh -huh. in the library? That was one of the things that sort of guided me to Islam. With the studying, my questions came back, but this time I could sort of base my questions on certain facts that I'd found and certain holes that I'd found within Christian and Jewish traditions. And also learning Arabic, there was one, I'd learned, when I was first learning Arabic, I'd learn a phrase a day. So one thing was, like, tomorrow there will be apricots, bukraf yimishmish. Then, then uh, we'd sort of, sort of try and sort of get the grammar from it. Then another phrase that uh, my course sister told me was uh, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. So it was like, it was interesting, the grammar. And I knew what it meant. And I was just sort of telling the novice mistress, who also happened to be the prioress, you know, oh, this is what... And she just asked, what did you learn for Arabic today? And I said, oh, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. And she went, what does that mean? Uh, I said, uh, God, is, there is only one God and Muhammad is his prophet. And she said, and she hit the roof. Really? I just, can imagine. And she's like, what are you being taught these things for? You should be, you know, learning about your religion, your church, your history about the Carmelite order. And I said, we just did it for the grammar. And, and I sort of like, I don't care, you're not doing Arabic again. I said, okay, that's up to you, mother. But... I'm good, I'll do Arabic secretly if you do, if you do that. Are you actually allowed to say something like that? Well, you sort of... There were, there were, the, the sister that was older than me in religion, who had be, just been professed, she was sort of all very... You no know, sort of great respect, and she wouldn't question the authority. But we were allowed to, in certain circumstances, to question the authority. Mm. And I said... It's just a language I'm learning. I'm learning it for the grammar. And if she hadn't have reacted that way, I wouldn't have questioned anything anymore. Sure. But the way she questioned it, I sort of thought, well, don't Christians believe that there is only one God? And they do, to their extent, and to their the field that they're thinking. But, and then I thought, okay, what about this Muhammad guy? I mean... It's supposed to be a prophet, but then the prophet should have ended just before Jesus. So, I have to find out about him. Because my um, medical checkups were still in London at the time, uh, I had to go down and uh, stay with one of the other monasteries' houses that used to be in Golders Green. And uh, so I thought, okay, if I get out early from my hospital appointment, I could go to the Edgeware Road and I could go and see if there are any Arabic things I could pick up for me and Sister Josephine. Okay, and I'll see if they've got like a Quran in English or something. So, after I'd finished, I went down to the Edgeware Road. I should have gone straight back to the monastery, by the way. And uh, I picked up a few newspapers and things and then I was in one shop and uh, the man said, Oh, you read in Arabic? And I said, Yeah. So he spoke to me in Arabic, and I spoke back, and I said, he said, oh, that's great, have them. I said, oh, thanks, but you don't happen to have, like, a, a Quran in English or something. He said, yeah, 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 take it, take it, and he gave me a Quran in English, and it was so small I could uh, fit it under my habit and sort of sneak it into the monastery. So, yeah. but they didn't have any, in, in our monastery library, they had two books on Islam, 
One was a very childlike book saying, know your Muslim neighbour. And the other one was, I think, on Sufism. Mm. Nothing about... So what happened um, with this smuggled Qur'an? Uh, oh, it got hidden in my... Well, it got hidden in my cell, which was my bedroom. The nuns refer to their bedrooms as cells. Uh, really? Yeah, it's supposed to go back to the... Because our order was like from the Middle East, it, the ancient rule, um, we had little s sort of hermitages on Mount Carmel, and the little hermitages were called cells. Right. So that's where it came from. Okay. So um, when you opened up this book and started to read, what happened next? It was sort of, I'd start reading it, and then things sort of, okay, so it says that in Christianity, I, I start thinking, that says that in Christianity, this says that in Judaism, but it's saying this in Islam. Mm. Actually, this is making more sense, and as the further I read on, um, sort of things sort of stood out, and the science of it stood out. The thing, it's been pointed out in other books, like things like, clouds, mountain formations, embryology, mm. things like that, and it's sort of, okay, th this is quite, this is something. Uh, and Could then, you discuss this with anybody, or was this something that you... Oh no, I didn't yourself? definitely not discuss not it with Not even to your co-colleague who you were studying Arabic with? No, no, because she, she saw, and she still is, she, she's very sort of Christian in her outlook and in her life, so I didn't... It was okay for me to be having some sort of questions or doubts in my faith, but I wouldn't want to inflict it upon anybody else. Somebody else. Sure. Because that, could, I, I always felt that that could knock somebody's faith in God. Sure. Yeah. Sure. So this comparative study, if you like, was taking place. I.e., you were coming across. You, you had some idea of Judaism. Of course, you were quite. Mm. Uh, f fluent in, in Christian theology and now you are coming across uh, Islamic theology and seeing yeah. that th no doubt many commonalities mm -hmm. however some differences and, yeah. and for the most part a lot of the differences made mm -hmm. more sense than what you mm -hmm. maybe uh, adhered to before Yeah. so then what happened? Um, it was coming across the, the verse in Surah Maida um, that there are priests and monks amongst you and, and they recognise the truth um, I think it's uh, Surah Maida 85 or 87, I'm not sure. And it was that verse that actually sort of, okay, then I put down the Quran and I didn't go back to it actually after that. And I was thinking, and, and then at the point, at that point, I was also, I was doing canon law, so it meant that I was representing other sort of people, especially religious sisters. Uh, if they, they wanted to leave or if they wanted to change a uh, house, for instance, there, there were certain things to go through and procedures. And I was also uh, looking into early Christianity, a, a degree level study. Okay. Everything that we studied, it was to quite a high level, but we could never get recognition from it because mm. nuns are supposed to be humble and self-effacing right um yeah sorry uh, we've just got five minutes left and unfortunately it, you know we haven't covered all of the stuff that we want want to but just tell me very quickly um uh, of, of course unfortunately I'm, I'm having to rush you a bit here first what was the straw that broke the camel's back in, in other words what mm. caused you to leave the order and then Second, how did you go about finding out more about Islam and, and becoming a Muslim? Yeah. At the time, my health was uh, deteriorated quite significantly. And also, for myself, I wasn't able to participate fully in the day-to-day uh, -day activities of the religious life. So I used that as an excuse to leave the order. There wasn't any one thing, but it was more to do with me deciding, right, I've got to go and find out about Islam and then I can become a Muslim. Really? Yeah. You'd made that decision? Yeah. So in my heart, Christianity, uh, that had stopped. So I'd left the order and it was over a period of 
18 months that I found out about things. It was such a lengthy thing because uh, my father died during that time and I also had to sort out uh, the financial arrangements for my mother and the, fa the rest of the family, uh, make sure everything was okay and then I could go ahead and set up. And then I'd started a college course and I met a few Muslims on that college course. So, and I asked one of the girls sort of about Islam and she and her brothers were into Sufism as their spirituality. So that's how I sort of found parts of Islam. And then uh, I'd become very ill. I was in hospital and uh, so ill that, uh, you know, it, it was whether I'd live or die or whatever. But then once I'd so, uh, sort of made my mind up when I'd uh, been discharged, I phoned my friend. I said, now I want to make shahada. Mm. Forget sort of teaching me any more about Islam. So she, she and her brothers had picked me up and we went to her house and were, all our friends, mutual friends were there. And so then I made shahada. Alhamdulillah. And this was how long ago? This was nearly seven years ago now. Seven years ago. Yeah. Alhamdulillah. And um, uh, how did you, because as you mentioned, they were of uh, Sufi persuasion. How, how did you find... The Ahlul Bayt, mm -hmm. I've only sort of found that recently, uh, within the last 18 months or so. Um, I knew of Shiism, Sunnis, uh, and other minor sects. I wasn't interested in placing myself in one camp or the other camp. So f maybe for the first five years, I did a lot of studying with Tafsir and uh, you know Sai Bukhari, Sai Muslim. But the the funny thing was, and I had a lot of Sunni friends, and they really sort of there were certain personalities in Sunni Islam that are quite prominent, but I was not attracted to. Mm. Whereas there are other figures that I were attracted to, but that lent more towards Shia Islam. But well, what was the attraction in the first place? Because the what towards Shia Islam? No, sorry, the personalities that you is this from <coughs> what from historical readings or yeah, and um, it was later on that uh, historical readings um, that I sort of become more okay, and and also using logic mm. and reading more widely and more academic papers. Sure, uh, and and the reaction of your Sunni friends was. It's sort of a hot potato, isn't it, if you say you're Shia or you lean more towards Shiism. It's that, oh, what are you doing being Shia? You know, they curse this person, they curse that person, they do this, they do that. They're this sort of people, they're that sort of people. And I'm like, I've never heard anybody cursing anybody else in mm. any aspect. And the things you refer to are actually... Like, for instance, they, they're so, you shouldn't have bidder, no bidder at all, but yet a lot of their historical figures have sort of based parts of Islam on bidder, mm. on innovations and things. Um, and it was reading a very good book by a non-Muslim, uh, Wilfred Mandel. Yes. Berg, Success, um, successor to the Succession prophet. to yes, the Prophet. Yes, beautiful book, yeah. Yeah, and that was... Uh, the, it wasn't on one side or the other, but the only conclusion I could come to then was mm. the, okay, Sunni Islam is Sunni Islam, but Shia Islam is mine. So I'm a Muslim and a Mu'mina. Inshallah, alhamdulillah, congratulations. And just, just finally, once you made that decision from all of the reading uh, and all of the studies that you went through, and of course that, the book you mentioned is quite an academic um, well, he's a professor in his own mm. right, uh, and his approach was very academic when he, he wrote that book. But once you made that decision, I mean, how did you go about it? Because if your, uh, if you like, circle of influence, your circle of friends were predominantly Sunni, mm. uh, and by the sounds of it, some of them were anti -Shi, um, you know, how did you then go and take the step? Was it something you did alone? Did you go out and find uh, a community? Um, going back to once I'd reverted, and I moved out of the family home. Um, I didn't know how to pray. I wasn't taught that. 
and it was a, a good friend of mine who taught me how to pray. But he, he prayed as a Shia Muslim, and, but I didn't know the difference between sure. Sunni or Shia uh, you know, ways of prayer. So, and I've always prayed as a Shia. So, and that only sort of came to me about three years ago. Thought, okay, fine, it's just prayer. And mm. I was doing it that way. Um, and now, uh, with the help of my friend as well, um, I've uh, been able to sort of widen my circle of Shia friends uh, by going. Uh, this year, I was. Uh, really happy to be involved in the Majlis uh, near to where I lived in Bolton and also um, you know have more sheer connections so between Bolton and Liverpool I've got some uh, s more sheer friends and contacts although I'm still in contact with my Sunni friends because sure. I don't I'm not gonna sort of stop contact like that with them sure. or at any time because first of all they did do a lot for me during my formative years but also they're good friends now and they're Muslims too of course so there's no need for any break up or breaking but if anybody sort of says you know you're doing this and you shouldn't be doing that and if I know correctly I'll tell them no this is this is the way because and ABC brilliant Sister Amina Khan, it's been a pleasure to have you with us. Uh, thank you very much for sharing thank your you. story. Exactly. From becoming um, almost at the cusp of becoming a nun uh, to, to becoming a, uh, a Muslim and a follower of the Ahlul Bayt. I'm sure you all uh, uh, will share me in thanking Sister Amina for that. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, and please remember if you know of anybody who would be interested in sharing their story of how they came to Islam, then please email us at reborn at ahlulbayt.tv once again thank you for watching assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh because uh, i don't know i thought okay that one will be enough and i'm not sure about contemplative order sure. but it was a priest who had said I went to that contemplative order the other day and they said you haven't written to them I was like, okay fine I'll write to them so and I asked if it would be possible to stay with them for three days in their guest house so and that was arranged okay. and that would be over the summer as well okay so presumably that summer you did but you were, you did both yeah okay and what was the conclusion you came to after experiencing both? Okay, the, the active order. I came to the conclusion that if you can juggle both lives of uh, uh, religious service to God and doing nursing, that's good. But I thought I couldn't do that because it would be like splitting myself into two. Really? Yeah. And uh, the contemplative order, now that was different. And uh, that specialised in nursing the elderly and the sick, and also running a guest house, hospitality. And the other address was of a contemplative order. One that meant that they didn't have, they wouldn't go outside for, say, for instance, to do teaching or social work or nursing. And their life was a life of prayer only. Oh, prayer only, okay. Mm. So the one I got in contact with first was the uh, active order, because I thought, okay, you get the best of both worlds. Uh, so the first thing I did was write a letter asking if I could come on uh, to come on a retreat. And uh, so I did do that later on in the summer. But it was to do, it was um, a one week retreat and then one week to work in the guest house. So I'd get a taste. Hmm. Um, I didn't actually write to the contemplative order more. And I met different sisters each day while I was there. The three days you were there. So <coughs> you then decided that you were going to, be, to join the contemplative order. And no, I thought my calling was 
sort of heading towards being contemplative, to be enclosed. Um, but it wasn't for another few years before I could um, actually join them. Because? Because of my age. Oh. I was 16, you have to be over 18. Right. Um, and also I looked into different contemplative orders during that time. Uh, and also another monastic house, which was of the same order as mm. the same ones I'd stayed with. So you joined, you joined one of the orders at the age of 18? No, <laughs> I was at a college doing my A-levels. Okay. And, um, I w and then I'd finished college and I went to, uh, on like a pilgrimage to Assisi and Rome. Welcome back to Reborn on Ahl al-Bayt TV with our guest today, Sister Amina Khan. And uh, just before the break, Sister Amina, you had got up to the point where the, those around you within the church realised that you were thinking about becoming a nun. Mm -hmm. How old were you at this point? Uh, I was I just turned 16. Right. Yeah. So literally a year or so into, into joining after joining the church? Mm, yeah. Okay. So, so you mentioned how the priest helped you get some numbers mm. and presumably you applied at, at that no. stage or later on? Um, the thing was, you, you, uh, he gave me two addresses to get in contact with. One was an active warden. I thought it was more inviting and more warm, even though at that point, I'd meet the sisters behind what was called a grill in the parlour, which was like um, meeting them behind a gate. Why was um, that? Well, it's to do with the rule of enclosure and how uh -huh. it's interpreted. Okay. So we'd be in a, um, a room, but it would be partitioned by a small wall and these gates, and part of the gate would open. And on my side, it would be carpeted and comfy chairs, warm, nice curtains, and then on their side, it was bare wooden boards, white wall, crucifix, a hard chair, and that was that. But actually, that appealed more to me. Mm. And also, at that, uh, the time I spent with them, I was also allowed in the garden. Um, so, and the gardens were huge. Mm. And they were nice. Uh, and so that's how I got to see sort of a bit.